Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground is brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Production funding for Common Ground is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Hi, and welcome to this week's edition of Common Ground. I'm your host, Ashley Hall. Common Ground is a new weekly series that highlights northern and central Minnesota culture. Each week, we'll explore the unique people, places, and events that are an important part of our region. Each week, Common Ground videographers, editors, and myself will take viewers on a journey of exploration into the worlds of art, history, and culture. This week, we'll introduce you to a married couple who finds beauty ingrained in wood, a metal sculptor from Breezy Point who uses various metals to create art, and come toward the William S. Marvin Training and Visitor Center in Warroad. My name is Dave Talley. I'm a woodworker. I am a wood turner. Uh, we build custom furniture to commission, but our principal art form is wood turning. Uh, Kathy and I are each going to turn a piece for you today, and we're going to and and hopefully those two pieces will illustrate one the techniques inherent in wood turning, but more importantly our personal vision and our personal aesthetic. I've been a woodworker for oh, over 40 years, made furniture, I'm self-taught. I've been a wood turner for probably 30 years, started out making reproduction spindles. And then over time I just started turning gift items and, and it just evolved and it's become our full-time occupation since we retired in, in uh, 2005. I've been turning about a year and a half. I watched Dave turn for years, he kept asking me. One day I said, okay, I'm ready, and I haven't turned the lathe off since. I love it, being able to see what I can do out of wood, with the different shapes, and it's, it's fun. I describe turning, I describe it as a Christmas present. You basically, it was something that was wrapped, and you take layer upon layer off as you're unwrapping your gift until you get to the finished product, which is inside. Dave and I, whenever we're done turning a piece, it's like as simple as it can be, we're always, you know, let's see what you did. You know, you apply that finish and there's no two alike. And it's, it's just exciting. Now granted, the, the, the wood itself brings a lot to the table. It exemplifies its life. If it grew on the north side of a hillside, it might not have had the sunshine. The, the grain might be a little different than if it were on the south side, if it had rain or if it had drought. Now all those characteristics are embedded in the wood. And my role is to help bring that to the surface, to the light of day, if you will. I like the Eastern aesthetic, less is more. We look for a very organic form, very organic shape that will not take away from the grain of the wood, but rather enhance the, the grain of the wood, the life of the wood, the life of the tree. We'll open a piece of wood, and as Kathy indicated, you never really know what's there. You've got an idea. Do I want to come in from the bark side and have a, have a symmetrical appearance, almost an agate effect? Or do I want more of an asymmetrical appearance in the grain? In that case, I'll come from the center of the tree as I enter the piece. And at the same time, when you get in there, you'll find voids, you'll find bark inclusions that you didn't know were there. And that's where the serendipity comes in, because if you stop in time, you'll look and it's there. If you don't stop, it may wind up on the floor with so many shavings and you never knew. And that was all part of what's captured in that moment in time when we open that piece of wood up. And if we're fortunate, we can find, we see that, and we discover it, and we make it permanent, if you will. Uh, woods and art is in the cultural heritage of everyone who walks the face of the earth. At one time, wood in every culture was used in a utilitarian way. And what we're trying to do is to re-engage people with that background. Uh, people are used to wooden cutting boards and wood on handles of knives, but they don't necessarily think about wood as a functional item from which to, to use every day. And you haven't had popcorn until you've had it out of a wooden bowl, I'll tell you that right now. Each piece that we make, and we've done 650 some pieces in 2009, each of those pieces has a little bit of us, a piece of our life. And we're all learning, I'm, I'm still learning, 30 years of turning, and I still learn. I learn from Kathy. And working together, it's, it, there's a synergy. It's almost zen-like. When you get into a rhythm, it's not work so much as it is um, joy. You strive to bring out the best line, the sense of form that you can. Uh, again, anticipating, as Kathy indicated, the end effect of the grain. There's something, uh, the essence of yourself that you're bringing to the piece. And uh, it's that 
that we strive to share with others. It's not just a piece of wood that's been turned that we're going to sell. It's a piece of ourselves. It's uh, the way we look at life and how we look at the world. Um, simple, less is more. Uh, the vast majority of our, our raw materials are from Minnesota. Uh, a, a large amount of our wood is from just west of here, Shevlin. Uh, we have a, a Dwayne Shoup is, is supplies with a lot of a lot of wood from his wood lot. So we're trying not only to share our work with with people, but we're trying to stimulate the local economic base uh, by by uh, we may earn the money elsewhere, but we spend it locally. So. It's been a fun, fun journey. It seems like yesterday I turned the lathe on and I made that very, that little chalice there. It was my first piece on the faceplate. Uh, and uh, we still have it. I wished we'd kept Kathy's first piece, but she insisted that we sell it uh, just to see if it would sell, I think. And it sold our first show probably within the first hour. Yeah, she does fantastic work. Now we have two different pieces of work and they're obviously different in form. But they're also different in, in our approach. I entered the wood from the, what would be the center of the tree, and I have an asymmetrical grain pattern, which was my vision for this piece. Kathy, on the other hand, entered from the, what would be the bark side of the tree. As she explained, she wanted this, this symmetrical agate effect and the pronounced grain pattern. Those were design um, decisions unique to each of us in our vision and our voice and uh, the fact that they're they're uh, similar in size but unique in shape I think reflect the fact that we're we're partners in this enterprise and uh, uh, we are mutually supportive and and we certainly uh, nourish each other and gain uh, uh, a very positive feedback from from uh, our relationship this is an opportunity for Kathy and I to be together seven days a week in the shop, uh, working together and, and experiencing uh, the joy that comes with creative self-expression. In 1904, George Marvin came to World to work for the Canadian Elevator Company. And he transferred here from a small town in Manitoba, Belmont, Manitoba. And he arrived on a January day, worked for the Canadian company for a couple years, and then left that company and worked for a Winnipeg company. In the meantime, the Canadian elevator company decided to dismantle the, their elevator here and they uh, rebuilt it in Saskatchewan. So George, and his partner, Percy Roberts, purchased the remaining business and formed their own company. That company was originally called Marvin, Roberts and Marvin. They had a lumber yard and a coal yard. They had a hardware store and they got into pulpwood. In 1916, he asked his brother to come and help in the business. His name is William. The story goes that he could sell you a can of paint even if you didn't need one. He was a very much a people person and was involved in the company. In the early years, Pulpwood was very big and um, kind of the history in the, in the 20s and 30s was they just, the Pulpwood in the winter or the summer it was um, catering to the fishermen and the farmers and uh, the lumberyard business, coal business. And then um, in 1939, uh, George's brother was diagnosed with inoperable cancer. And so George's oldest son, Bill, William S. Marvin, for whom this building is named, um, was called home by his father to help in the business. 
and he became the eighth employee in Marvin Lumber and Cedar, which is our parent company name still today. George had five sons, five sons and a daughter. Four of the five Marvin sons went to war and fought. Bill Marvin stayed in Warroad. As the oldest son, he, he stayed here. Um, Cal and Jack both fought in the Pacific. Uh, Tut Marvin was located on the East Coast. He was in the Coast Guard. And Frank Marvin flew for both the British and the American Air Force. For a short period of time during the war years, the company was involved in um, building granaries, building ammunition boxes, um, providing cattail fluff for a factory in Michigan for lifesavers. And then after the war, they had a three-year contract with the Campbell Soup Company to sort peas. By the time the war was over, he had invested in a company up in Canada, so one son went up there to manage that. Uh, two of the other sons, along with Bill, worked with their father in the Marvin Company here in Warroad. Uh, one was in the seed house, had the marine shop, the other was take, took over the lumber yard office from his dad. And then the fifth son went out on his own and built a resort down on the lake. His name was Cal, and he, uh, he wanted to have his winters free for hockey, so he did the summer resort, and the, which left his, his time in the winter for his passion. It was hard for George to see what Bill could see, and Bill really wanted the company to move forward and to provide employment for people who were coming back from the war. They wanted a place where young men could stay in Warroad and in the area. And so it was his vision that to be able to do this, they had to uh, create more opportunity. And so in 1955, when George Marvin returned from a visit to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, he found out that Bill had gone ahead and purchased a piece of equipment. And actually, he had to break a hole in the wall of the building to move that e equipment in. But George was very upset that Bill purchased this uh, double antenna and a Madison molder. George felt we needed a new elevator instead. George felt Bill was going to break the company with the purchases that he made. Bill had so much vision and he just knew that this would be the right thing to do. What started it was, Harry York was a lumberyard manager for George, and he asked Bill to get a DeWalt saw so that he could make door frames in the wintertime to keep himself busy. And so that's the beginning of the window and door company as we know it. Bill and Margaret had six children, four sons and two daughters, and their youngest daughter is the president of Marvin Windows and Doors. Their oldest daughter worked for the company for a short period of time as a project manager for this building. And uh, their other, their four sons, uh, three of whom are still with the company, their second oldest son, Jake, is our CEO and chairman of the board. Frank Marvin um, is involved with customer relations and Bob Marvin is retired. He was the transportation, uh, vice president of transportation. The other story that is important to the Marvin family and to the company is that not only is their family, uh, generations of their family working in the company and have worked, but many of our employees have had generations of their own families working in the company. So we have a display over here that shows pictures of families, some up to four generations, who are and have been working here. In 1932, George Marvin started um, at the Fourth of July celebration giving nickels to children. And all they had to do was sign their name on a piece of paper. And they had to be 12 and under. And he would give them two nickels. And those pages have been kept 
through all these years and you can find them in the museum. So we have generations of families that come and they can find up to three and maybe four generations of their own family in these books. This gentleman was our, our first plant manager, Bob Wenzel. He was a commercial fisherman and he came to work for George and manage the plant. And he didn't, he didn't want to hire women in production, but there's a story on the board over there about the first three women that were in production and they were excellent workers. And from then on it was, it was okay to hire women. This is a great story too. This lady was hired in 1957. She's still working for the company in accounts receivable. You can imagine all the changes she has seen. And uh, 1957 was our first profit sharing, and this is the bag that she received her silver dollars in. <laughs> the major fire was 1961 when the entire plant burned down. We did have two prior fires, uh, 46 and 48. It, it wasn't such a huge loss for those two fires because we were just starting. 61, it was, it was devastating. All of a sudden, 172 people don't have jobs and uh, the Marvin family actually got offers from towns outside of Warroad, outside of the area to move their business and they very strongly committed to this community and made the decision to stay here and rebuild. We have a wonderful story to tell and the family thought it was important that it be documented and actually the timing of the museum was perfect because the old hardware store building was being torn down so many of the artifacts that were in that building are now in the museum. The elevator that stood out here along Highway 11 was torn down and we've used those things in there. Um, many of our first employees were getting quite old and so to be able to get their stories in print and documented was huge because they actually lived it. Hi, my name is Jeff Kreitz. I'm from uh, Breezy Point, Minnesota. And welcome to my shop, Creative Steel. Uh, I've been in business about 18 years and uh, I just want to tell you a little bit about what we do here. I do uh, metal sculpture and uh, functional artwork, furniture, gates, railings, and um, anything that has some design to it in metal. Uh, the fellows that work for me have a lot of varied backgrounds and interesting backgrounds. Uh, Bob, Bob Pelzo would be, uh, he was in the printing industry for a lot of years and uh, he, he lives very close to me and actually he's an old friend of mine. We knew each other as teens and we get along very well. And uh, Adam Wegman is a uh, jeweler and uh, also has a lot of machining experience. Uh, he's been in school for machining as well. Uh, a lot of his, his experience helps us a lot here. And uh, basically we like, we like uh, rock and roll and we like to work with heavy metal. And this, this uh, project that we're working on here, this is a sketch for the, uh, a sculpture for a donor board at uh, St. Joseph Medical Center in Brainerd. And uh, I've been commissioned to do a sculpture and what I do first, um, when I'm contacted by whatever uh, party that might be, I uh, first, I, a lot of times I'll do a sketch. And I propose a sketch, I talk to the people, they tell me, you know, what they would like, what, you know, whatever vision they have for a particular piece of artwork, and I listen to them, and uh, then from there I, I take it and I do a sketch. This is a, uh, you know, a, 
partial size sketch of the sculpture that we'll be working on here today. When we talked about doing the sketch with the ladies from the hospital, we talked about, you know, this sculpture is going in the new cardiovascular ward. So we've incorporated a heart into the landscape. And that heart kind of represents the heartbeat of the, of the land, so to speak. And it's, the, the hospital's by a river, so we've also incorporated water into this sculpture. You can see here, the uh, stainless steel that is representative of water. And uh, the roots are also incorporated into the uh, heart here. And also all the trees are interconnected to show that everything is somewhat interconnected in life. So that was my idea with this. You know, you can do just a, a regular landscape, but I also like that you know, you can make statements in your artwork too as well. Anything's possible with artwork. And uh, from there, from the sketch, we go to the, what we call a maquette or a model of that piece. And uh, this can be presented with the sketch at that time. You can have a sketch and everything's one dimensional, but it also helps when you're presenting things to potential potential clients to have a maquette. This is a, a northern landscape sculpture. You can see we have brass and stainless and steel and copper with different patinas and the landscape has different metals in it as well. After we uh, get a, assemble a lot of the pieces and I've done a lot of welding on the stocks and start to weld some of the, the leaf clusters on to get the detail uh, in the stock, this is uh, called wire feed welding. And uh, what I do is I, you know, I take a lot of uh, heavy rods and I weld in between those to get that stock. And the welds help to give it the, the stock a lot of texture. And I can run a lighter weld to give it a, a bark-like appearance. And then from there, we'll take and grind that down a little bit so it uh, gets a little shinier and uh, takes our patina a little nicer. And uh, we get a lot of the landscape ground and welded and shaped the way we want it. Then I'll take these pieces or these trees and start to weld them in their place where they're to go. I just kind of lay everything, just get a bunch of trees and start to lay this thing out. And this is, this is our heart that's going to be incorporated into the sculpture. And this is made out of copper. And this will be going to this recessed area. And then I will weld a lot of the roots. The root structure will also come down into this heart. And um, you can see the different metals we have in here. We've got brass and stainless and bronze and steel and we're going to use different different uh, uh, chemicals to put patinas on this steel and uh, then a clear finish over that so it doesn't uh, rust and the front is all stainless it's it's pretty dull right now because it just has the mill finish on it but once it's uh, cleaned up and ground it'll be very very shiny and and uh, look real nice so in my pieces I like to use different metals because uh, I don't like to paint over fine metal, um, just as you would not paint over fine woodwork. You know, you have all the, the natural colors of things right in, in the earth come from the metals, you know, they're, they're all right there. So um, we just try to enhance those colors and, and use different ways of, uh, to patina those and finish them or burnish them and grind them and a lot of different ways to get a lot of a nice look out of metal. How I select my metals, um, a lot of the outdoor pieces that I do may have a lot of stainless steel in them. Stainless is great because it, it lasts a long time outdoors. It doesn't, uh, doesn't rust. And uh, I can also use copper with that. I may even use steel and let some of that rust. And I think that uh, with sculpture these days, I know in the 70s they used a lot of steel or iron and they just let it rust. 
But uh, my take on that these days is to have stainless steel and copper and brass mixed in with that steel uh, to give it some color and not just to have a one colored sculpture but to have many colors and uh, without painting. And I try to get uh, American made steel and stainless as much as I can. And uh, I'm all for supporting uh, the Iron Range and uh, you know I just really believe in if we support our local businesses and our local artisans and tradespeople and uh, even the people that grow food locally and try to support them as much as possible and put some of these people back to work or keep the ones that are working in business. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you enjoyed tonight's show and we look forward to seeing you next week right here on Common Ground. If you have a segment idea for Common Ground, please contact us at legacy at lptv.org or call us at 218-333-3022. individual segments or copies of Common Ground, please call 218-333-3020. Production funding for Common Ground is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. If you enjoyed this segment of Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground, consider making a contribution at lptv.org.